Hey everyone, and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In today's video, I interview a gentleman from the state of Missouri, and he has an amazing Bigfoot encounter to share with everyone. This encounter is not only exciting, but it's also very terrifying, and it will make you think twice about ever going into the woods again. This Bigfoot encounter took place in Swedeborg, Missouri, just north of the Gasconade River in Pulaski County. There has been many Bigfoot encounters reported in the Fort Leonard Wood area and all around the Gasconade River. This interview has a twist to it, and to keep the comments clean, I have decided to put the full story on my membership page to better protect the guest. He dives into some deep theories regarding aliens, the human hybrid program, and how the aliens are manipulating mankind. So this isn't to hide any information from anyone, just the story has two sides to it, and I know a lot of people will disagree with it. So if you are in to the alien side of Bigfoot, definitely go to my membership page and check it out. So the regular viewers, you aren't missing any of his Bigfoot encounter story, just the ending of the podcast where he talks about his theories and research regarding the topic and how it's connected to aliens. But it's a really good theory, so if you're into something different, definitely check it out. If you have a Bigfoot encounter that you would like to share on the channel, please contact me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. Alrighty guys, let's not waste any more time and let's dive straight into Chad's Bigfoot encounter from the state of Missouri. So this happened on Sunday, September 19, 1982. It was my birthday. So the day before this all happened, my grandfather raised championship hunting dogs. He uh, had 40 to 60 hunting dogs at all times. And he was constantly training them and selling them, you know, because that's what you did in the 70s. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, by this point, he no longer had any dogs. But the reason why I tell you this is because my grandfather was a professional hunter. He grew up in the woods in the 20s with six other brothers and four other sisters. And, um, you know, he's, he was just a guy of the woods, especially in Missouri. The day before, on Saturday before, where we take off down out the driveway and down the dirt road and get up to T Road. Uh, do you know where T Highway is in Pulaski County? No, I don't. Okay, so I don't know if you know the area very well, but as you're coming from Waynesville towards Buckhorn, about halfway down on the right-hand side, coming from Waynesville to, to Buckhorn, mm -hmm. there's T Highway on the right. Okay, well, I know and, where both of those towns are, so I know the okay. general location. Okay, so you take a right and head towards Swedeborg. You know where that's at? No, I don't. Little tiny town between Crocker, Missouri, and and Richland, kind of. Oh, okay, yeah. But you head towards Swedeborg on T Highway, and it's Palm Road 745 on the left. That's where we live down there. It's, it used to be called Lewis Ridge because my family owned most of it. Most of them lived on the ridge. But um, so... The day before, we're starting. We pull out the off the dirt road onto the highway, and we get up to probably forty mile an hour. And we're going. If we go there, if we want to go in there, I'll show you. But he all of a sudden slams the car into a stop. I mean, just slams it into a sliding stop on a real dangerous hill that people come up and down the hill at sixty five mile an hour. 
he slams it in reverse and we go back and back up the hill and he starts saying there's no way it can't be there's no way it can't be and we get back up to where he can look in this part of the field and well, i'd been hunting there with him on that side of the road and he told me you know he's told me about the whole area around there because he grew up around there you know and he said i knew there used to be an old house place up there with an apple tree because me and him had actually stopped there and got an apple off the apple tree before in the year or two prior well, we we come to a stop and he's looking at the apple tree. And he's just looking at the apple tree. He steps out of the damn car and runs up the other side of the bank. And he's up on top of the bank, 20 foot above me there. Car sitting in the middle of the road with the door open. Now, my grandfather had had a brother who lived in Washington State and did nothing but hunt bear. They're not scared people, you know, neither him or any of his brothers were scared people. They're mountain boys, what they were, they're hillbillies. So I didn't understand at all what he was doing. So when he got back to the car, I said, What was it, Grandpa? What was it? Ah. Okay, bed. Didn't rain or rain. Got your clothes, car windows. But um, so he says, ah, oh. go ahead. No, I was going to say, can you say that part again? You kind of cut out there just the last he, 10 seconds. Yeah. So I, he got back in the car and I said, you know, what was it, grandpa? What was it? And he says, ah, oh, you'd have to know him. And his ah oh, just meant he didn't really want to tell you or didn't really know. And so I said, Miguel, what was it, Grandpa? What was it? And he said, ah, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And I said, what was it, Grandpa? What was it? And he said, ah, I'm not going to tell you because you'll tell people and they'll think I'm crazy. So we go on to town and come back that night. That Sunday, my grandfather was one of those types of people that went into town every Sunday and went drinking with his drinking coffee with his buddies in the morning and have breakfast and all that stuff. And I knew he was going into town Sunday morning early. I didn't ever go with him to the Sunday morning breakfast with his buddies and stuff, you know. I always just sat around the house or whatever. But I told Grandpa that tomorrow morning I'm gonna get up and grab my poles and go down to the to the pond, the lake down behind the house. So a couple of years previously, you know, I'm a mountain kid, you know, I'm a, I'm a hillbilly kid. I'm running around out in the woods just nonstop, just nonstop with a 410 or a 22 in my hand. I had hunting dogs and anything that I really wanted to choose, like rabbit beagles or whatever I wanted, you know. I was never too dumb to hunt anything but coons, anything I wanted to take, but I didn't take any dogs. I was just going down to go fishing. I told Grandpa that I'd kind of fish up some fish for dinner that night. So I got up, I don't know, about 9 o'clock or something that morning. He was already gone by 5.30, 5 o'clock in the morning probably. And I got my poles. I pulled my chicken livers out of the freezer and caught my lures and stuff like that. And got everything ready to go fishing. I had a, you know, the old metal stringer, got the little C clamp hooks on them where you hook it to a fish's mouth and gill. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, the old metal ones. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of stringer I had. That'll come in to play here in a bit. Anyway, I took off down over the hill behind the house, stepped over to his property sense and into the creek bed. I always ran the creek bed once I got down to the bottom of the hill because it was still September, but at the time there was still quite a bit of greenery on. You know, it wasn't October falling leaves or nothing. And this is back 40 years ago when the weather acted right. So I go be bobbing off down to the woods and I always went to the creek bed because the brush and the, you know, vines, ticks, chiggers, and spiders, tons of spiders down there and stuff. It was easier to walk the creek bed. And I say creek bed, it's not a creek. It's just where 
two different sides of a big hill run all the water down into the center of a gully in this little valley. And over the hundreds of years, it's basically turned the bottom into all gravel, you know, this little creek. On each side of the little creek, there's little cedar trees on each side where they've washed down through the ages or whatever. So it's, you know, it's kind of a secluded little walk down the middle of that path. It ain't quiet, but I didn't have to deal with a bunch of foliage, ticks, ticks and chiggers and stuff like that. So I get down to, I walk down through the creek and across this old fence that was probably a hundred years old or more. And a really old barbed wire fence made out of the old cowboy barbed wire. And you step over it right at the end of the creek, really, where it empties into this pond that Earl Grice had, or uh, Lee Hickey had made, I think. I think he made the pond, I'm pretty sure. But it's big. It's like probably 150 yards across and then 100 wide. It's kind of teardrop shaped with the top of the teardrop headed into the creek or up that, you know, from that creek area where all the water would rock down into it. And uh, I get down there about 11, 11.30, something like that. I think it's about 11.30. And uh, start fishing, put two fishing poles in the water for cats and start using my flipping rod. And I sat there for probably an hour, hour and a half, flipping my flipping rod, catching little small, smallies and small largemouth, none of them really to keep. But I'd caught four different uh, catfish that were probably over four pounds each or something, five pounds. There's a flathead that probably went six. But I had four decent sized catfish on my stringer. Stuck on the side of the bank there. I walked all the way to the other side of the. I just did. It had gotten kind of hot, and the sun was like right over the, right over the pond. And I realized it'd been a little cool, and I thought it yeah, did. I was not getting really any bites on catfish anymore, so I thought I'd walk to the other side of the, the other side of the pond, and fish a little bit. And when I got over the other side of the pond, man, I just felt really weird. I just, I felt it before in the woods around there, but I just felt weird. It just feels like someone's watching you. You know, you stop, look around, and listen, and it's don't hear anything, you know. And I'm walking along over there, and I don't know why, but I turned around towards the woods, and a little pebble hit me right in the cheek, right beside my nose, right like right beside my nose, and it stung. That was the first weird thing that happened, but, you know, you tell yourself a lot of stories as to what things are out there or not or what happened, you know, and I convinced myself that what had happened was is that a tornado had come through or high wind and lodged a rock up in the tree, and it was kind of a windy day. I thought, well, you know, maybe this rock come out of a tree and hit me in the face. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a win, I'm sure of that. So I get back over the other side of the pond, and it's probably 1 30, 2 o'clock. You know, I had a watch on at the time, but I didn't look at my watch during this little period of time at all. And I'm sitting there, and I know that the hickeys come home about one o'clock to two thirty or so from church and i don't want to be seen by them although they don't mind that i'm down there we've already talked to the hickeys but i go down there all the time you know i'm shit i would go down there every day of the week sometimes for weeks at a time and go down there and just fish and fish and fish and fish and fish and uh i heard something so at the by at the, so the lake has kind of got three hills on each side with one big hill that at the time was pretty much cleared of trees and was just kind of a field going up over the top of the hill. And I heard a, 
you know when someone runs down a hill, like you're running down the hill, your feet make that clop, 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 because you're trying not to go too fast, but you're going down the hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I absolutely heard that square behind me. And I actually thought, oh, shit. You know, Lee Hickey's coming down the hill out you know, to get after me or something, you know. And I turned around and looked up the hill, and the sun was right kind of over the top of the hill, shining right behind whoever or whatever this was. And I said, Lee, I was just getting ready to leave. And I, and I was just getting ready to leave. I'd already had my stringer, pull, my stringer pulled up. And I had my poles all gathered, and I had a um, those old, um, you know, you can buy them in stores like five bucks. Those fillet knives look like they got an Indian leather case and a wood handle and a real sharp bit blade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had one of those with me, and I turned around to say that to him. And it's like I can see him coming down the hill or the shape of what of him coming down the hill. I didn't pay attention to how big it was or whether or not I could see him well because well, the sun was right square in my eyes over his shoulder or what I thought was him. And, I, and so I turn back to my equipment and I grab it up and I'm saying, Leah's just getting ready to leave. You know? And then when I turn back around, there's nothing there. There's literally nothing there. So I kind of stepped towards the side of the hill, which would be over the hill towards this property, and I don't see anything. So I wasn't real sure whether or not I'd even seen what I saw. You know, I knew I heard what I heard, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't necessarily see Lee because the sun was behind him, and it glared me in the face, and I immediately turned around to grab my stuff, and I was just going to stand up and talk to him. When I stood up, there's nothing there. And I got the ickiest, shittiest feeling. You just had a just had a real icky, shitty feeling. And it just made me bolt. So I just took off running like hell beside the pond towards the tree line. And I think it waited until I got right close to the tree line because I heard it. You and I turned and looked just as I got towards the fence, and this solid black son of a bitch, probably I don't know, eight and a half, nine foot tall. It was huge. It probably weighed if it if it weighed a half an ounce, it weighed seven hundred pounds or more. They had a solid black face, and I mean solid black. But its face kind of reflected the sun a little bit. Um, the way I always tell people the skin look is it looked like the skin on a cow's nose. You know, it looked like hide still, maybe, but it was that smooth, kind of shiny skin on a cow's nose, but it was his whole face. Um, I didn't see him at any time that he chased me. I didn't see him to have a cone head either. He was just black monkey monster. The hair on his chest got a little brown and red as he would move. I'm sure that's just because it was thinner on his chest and abdomen and stuff like that. But he was solid fucking black, as black as he could be. So when I saw him, of course, you know, I freaked out, you know, 13 year old kid. And I hit that fence the next six foot and just hurdled it and ran about two feet. And my mind told me that I better turn around because, you know, he might be coming to kill me. So I hopped over the fence, went about two feet, turned to look over my left shoulder. And that's how bitch made it all the way from over the edge of the hill where Lee Hickey's house was going down towards his house and he'd crossed probably it's been many years but i'm going to say he crossed a hundred yards in shit, uh, two seconds like i don't know it was fast and he was at the edge of the tree line to my left at about 50 60 yards and all of a sudden i heard something to my right 
and I, it was like a, you know, a, like that, you know, like um, like the way a woman might gasp for breath or something, or she's startled or something. And when I turned to my right, there was a goddamn female about four and a half, five foot tall, and she was red brown all the way through her color, all the way through her color. And her eyes were solid black and her eyes were so wide that I could have put my entire hand between her damn eyeballs. So she looked kind of down syndrome, you know, but at the same time, she was a damn hairy monster thing, you know, but she had a little one in her left hand standing there. that was about three foot tall or something. And she kind of pushed it back behind her. And about that exact second, the male back to my left, he hollered again. And I could see he was looking through the woods at me and had a stick in his hand. And when I met eyes with him, he threw that stick right at me just as accurate as he could. It was probably a foot long and three inches round. And he threw it at me. And I literally turned my head because he threw it right square at me to hit me in the left arm. And in my left hand, I'm carrying my my uh stringer full of fish you know full five six fish on it i don't remember exactly how many i had now i think i had four and uh i had my poles in that hand also holding them around and holding the holding my uh stringer and in my right hand I had my tackle box and that knife and i freaked out and just started running down through that thing just as fast as i could because I had never, like, I had grown up in Washington State off and on, so I'd heard about Bigfoot, but it didn't cross my mind that that's exactly what this was at the time, because I was just afraid it was going to meet me or something. I thought it might be a gorilla that was loose or something, you know? Like, I really didn't know. You know, just a kid. And I'd been all over the woods, never seen anything like this, man. And I'd seen a Black Panther at 12 in Missouri on Fort Leonard Wood. You know, I'd probably killed 35, 40 deer by the time I was 13. I'd hunted with dogs of all different kinds, coyotes, foxes, you know, rabbits, everything. So I'm just freaking out, and I'm running down the, the creek. And I got to thinking, what it was, so you can't really, I couldn't really see to the right because there was just a wall of foliage now. And off to the left, I could see between the cedars and out to the trees, and it was still following me, watching me. And it, it would run when I would run and stop when I would stop. And I think about the second time I stopped, uh, he threw another big piece of log on me, about two foot long or something. And by this time, I'm pretty much freaking out. I think I'd probably pissed my pants by this time. And took off running again. And it's run along beside me the whole time. And it's hollering. It hollered like four times. But the first time was when, when it hollered at me when it came back up over the hill. And it sounded like an angry holler. And the other three, looking back on it, the other three kind of seemed like they were, I don't know, informing that female or others of where they were at or where I was at or where I was going. And I made that probably 100-yard dash down to the creek bed and I knew when I got out of it, when I come to the end of the creek bed, there was going to be a short area where I was going to come out by the fence. And, of course, the fence is clear basically on each side of the fence for a couple of feet. And it just fucking, I thought I was going to die right there. I thought that's where I die. It's going to just going to meet me at the top of the creek. It's just going to pull my arms off and kill me or something. And as I got up there, I could tell it was still, it was closer. It was probably 35 yards, 30 yards away, but it was, it was right there at the front of this, this dry creek start with me. And I turned and looked to the right just to make sure I wasn't being 
flanked by something and going to be killed by it. And this time he threw a stick about a foot and a half long by about five inches long. And he threw it super hard. Like he threw it hard. And it hit me right between my elbow and my shoulder. And it hit me right on the bone. Left a bruise for like three weeks. But it took like three weeks for it to go away totally. But he hit me right in the arm with it. This is where you're probably not going to like my story. So he hit me in the arm with it. I dropped my poles and the and, uh, string of fish. And I reached down to grab, I instantly reached down to grab my poles back. And I, he either, it either said aloud or it said in my head, and I don't know which. And I've had plenty of nightmares that never told me which it was, but it said, or it said in my head, fish, like it was clear as day, fish. And that was it, man. I just, I didn't even pick up my stringer. I just turned and started running as fast as I could up the hill. And I could tell that it wasn't following me up the hill, you know, because it wasn't breaking brush and snapping brush and shit like it was. It was running along beside me. And I never saw the female or the little one again. And I think back now that had he known I was that close up, he might have just went out there and snapped my neck. I don't know. But I think he'd been a lot madder if he'd known I was right there by his sister or girlfriend or whatever the hell it was. But so I run about... 40, 50 yards up the hill. It's about 100 yards total up the hill to get to my grandfather's trailer. I ran about 40 yards up the hill, and I turned around and looked back. And this son of a bitch is sitting in one of the biggest cedars down there, and it's looking right at me, right at me. And all of a sudden, a red orb, about the size of a marble, maybe, and a white orb, maybe the size of a ping pong ball or baseball or something. And they both just popped into existence above his head. And the red thing was, a red orb was right above his head. The white one was a little above the red orb. But it looked at me, and I swear to God, it smiled. And it, dude, it disappeared. It just, it just fucking disappeared right there in the cedar tree and it and it was standing kind of in the cedar tree. And the cedar tree wasn't displaced. Like the cedar tree wasn't breaking because this tiny body thing was standing in it. It was almost like he was standing in the middle of it and it wasn't bothering it. And like say, you know, and then that's it. And that was just uh, maybe two seconds. I turn around and I catch the orbs above his head, and then he just uh, fucking disappears like a fart in the wind. I turn around and kept running up the hill, come around the backside of the trailer to try and see if my uncle or anybody's home. And there wasn't nobody home yet. My grandfather wasn't home yet. I ran in the trailer, went back to my grandfather's room, and grabbed an eleven hundred. And then they're always sitting there loaded. I grabbed an 1100 and went into my bedroom to change into a pair of sweatpants because I'd pissed all over myself when I'm watching out my window in my bedroom to see if I see anything and didn't. And sat in the living room for another hour and a half with a shotgun and a pair of sweats. It's just basically a stupor as to what happened. And my grandfather come home, and I told him that I'd been chased out of the woods by Bigfoot. And he looked at me real strange at first, and he said, oh, hell, you didn't see no Bigfoot. And I said, Grandpa, I got chased by the goddamn thing, and I saw a little female and a little one, too. And I was right behind the house. Oh, hell, you didn't see that. I said, well, I did see it, Grandpa, and I'm not ever going back in the woods ever again. And he said, well. You don't need to tell that story on yourself and people think you're crazy. Well, that's the same damn thing he said the day before 
what he had to crawl out of the car in a dangerous area to get up on top of a hill where an apple tree was at. But he said, he'd never believe me. So the only other thing I have passed out is that a year and a half later, I think I had one staring in my window, maybe the same one. And the trailer was way up on blocks. Like this thing would have had to have been shit out 10 feet tall at least. Like 10 feet tall would have had to been to look in my bedroom window at least. And, um, but I didn't, I started to go back in the woods two days later. And about halfway down that hill, about where I was standing, my grandfather had cut a couple of trees because he didn't, he just wanted them gone there beside the, the cesspool and stuff. And he just wanted them gone. And sitting, shoved into one of those stumps, is my is one of the one of the fucking um, uh, stringer metal C clamps had been pulled out and straightened, and then shoved into this fucking tree stump about three inches. And you could tell it wasn't beat in with a hammer. And there was no marks on the wood on top or nothing where you know, it been beat in. It literally just been shoved in by this thing's hand. But there was no fish on it or nothing. All the fish were gone, but my stringer sitting there shoved into that cut stomp, you know? Yeah. And uh, it uh, it wrecked me. It changed my whole life. I couldn't go in the woods anymore. I was sick for weeks. Just sick with nerves, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And when my grandfather didn't really want to talk about it at all, so I just, you know, he just wasn't going to talk about it. He just wasn't going to talk about it. It got so that when I would mention it, he would get pissed off to me. Ah, oh, shut up. Don't tell that story. You know, so I don't know what. Whether or not he died just a couple of years later, and he died suddenly, and I never really got a chance to corner him about things like that. But I would ask him, like after that, I found out a lot more about my family. I found out that my great grandfather, Oba Hensley, had had some kind of UFO experience while out fox hunting. And when I would ask my grandfather, the man who spent the most time in the woods ever, if he'd ever seen anything in the woods, he'd always say no. Every time, no, nah, there ain't nothing out there. But he came from a different era, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm afraid that he saw it the day before. So that's my story. Okay. So going back to the Sasquatch when you first encountered him, you mentioned that he had a dark, dark face and dark body. Was this all jet black? Jet black, bro. Jet black. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's similar to one that I encountered. And um, the one I encountered was jet black, and it had these whitish gray stripes going down its back and on the back of its calves. Wow. But yeah, the face, when you described that, how dark it was, that's the exact same Just, thing I saw. I'm not sure if it was hair on what I saw, like short hair, or like what you described, like a cow's nose, how black it is, and like that skin texture. Just black, bro. His whole face was black, though. Like his whole face was black. His eyes, you could tell, were black. I think you could kind of see some whites in them, but like I can't. You know, I can't say for sure on that, but I can tell you that his eyeballs were black. His face was black. Never saw a tooth in him. I never uh, never saw a tooth. Never saw any teeth. I saw him yelling at me, but I wasn't paying any attention to his teeth. I was paying attention on whether or not he was trying to make a beeline at me. You know, it wrecked me. I haven't been in the woods really since. You know, and I grew up in the woods, and my hands are just shaking right now. 
I was just shaking my heart out of No, I understand. Um take your time if you need to. Um when well, when the orb showed up above him, is that when he disappeared? Yeah. Yeah, I first went red, white, boom, boom, and just appeared. Bang, bang. Because when I first turned around, he's just standing there and he's only like head out of the out of the cedar tree. Maybe a little bit of his left shoulder because he's actually pointing towards he was facing the same direction he was when he threw the last log at me and knocked all the shit out of my hand. But mm-hmm. how big were the was, logs? Well, the last one, like say about four inches round and about a foot long. And he threw them like a damn boomerang expert. You know what I mean? Like he threw them with the expertise of something that lives in the woods, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. And he followed you the entire way out of there. Do you think he, yeah. he simply just wanted the fish, or was he trying to get you? I think he wanted the fish. I, then, uh, you know, you get 40 years. So that experience sent me on a life of being a ufologist, Bigfoot hunter. Not that I went in the woods, but I've read and kept track of every single thing I can since then. And what I think was going on is that because of the valley back there is so good, like the Gasconade River's right over the hill. Okay. So water source in the Gasconade's right there. And then on this side of the hill, Earl Grice and Lee Hickey both had big fields of soybean and stuff like that. And it went on each side of the road. So, you know, great place to, you know, find prey animals and stuff like that or alternate things to eat. So I think what it did is, is it had probably watched me fish there before. And most of the time when I fished there, I would throw everything back because I was, crazy shit was happening in that pond. Like I was catching catfish on bass lures. That sounds like an absolute bullshit lie, but I have a living cousin that can tell you that's the damn truth because he went down there with me and did it. But that's how hungry the fish were there, you know. So I was down there all the time, and I think it had seen me down there before, and it was one of the few times that I'd ever carried a string or a fish out of there. And I think it just absolutely couldn't help itself. I think it had been over at Lee Hickey's house. Like, I think these things learn your patterns. So I think it came from Lee Hickey's house and came up and over the top of the hill and found me there fishing. And I don't know how long it watched me. But when I stood up to leave with that string of fish, I think it thought it was going to scare me out of them or scare them off of me or just get me to drop everything and run away. And I wasn't dropping $250 worth of lures in the early 80s in my tackle box i wasn't dropping my poles i just wasn't it was gonna have to come kill me with them in my hand or something you know i don't know just you know a good hillbilly doesn't drop his gun either you know so yeah anyway you know so i just think that it wanted my fish there's only a couple of mysteries that i have about it anymore and one is did it say fish or from what i've learned over the past 30 years that it say fish in my damn head and I don't know yeah a lot of people have mentioned the mind speak situations um I think I know where this area is is it located by Fort Leonard Wood the army base yeah but it's you know it's 25 miles from the base or so Mm -hmm. driving you know what I mean yeah, but you got to a... go seven and a half miles out seven four out out, out uh, T Highway, mm-hmm. and then you got to turn down Farm Road seven forty five and go about a mile or a third or something like that, or oh yeah, about a mile, and then it was down over the hill there. Yeah, there's a lot of forest out there. If you would dive into the juveniles' description the best you can, please. the young ones. The young ones, the yeah. young ones. Yeah, the little ones, if you would describe the so details. So the female looked like. So the female's color was exactly. Have you ever seen the movie, the show Land of the Lost? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so the female looked just like Chaka as far as his her color mm -hmm. and the way her fur looked like not like the not like the big male the big male like you could almost see like purples and stuff coming off his fur as he was getting across that open field to get to the tree line you know how black will almost look like it's got a purple sheen to it you know mm -hmm. like that's how he looked but she was just light brown just caramel brown and her hair was matted like hell and she had a retard's face. Just um, she just had she had big eyes, and she had just a normal kind of nose. I can't really place her nose. Uh, her mouth looked normal. I don't remember anything being abnormal about her mouth, but her eyes were black too, and they were so wide. They were so wide. Her eyes looked like they were literally on. You know, like the furthest outside edges that her eyes can be, but still looking forward. This huge spot between her nose and the skin was gray. Like the skin on her face was gray. It was not black at all. It was solid fucking gray. And she didn't have any hair on her face, but neither did he. He had hair around his face, but he didn't have like a mustache or anything like that. I've heard people talk about they can tell they have beards that go into their fur. I didn't see him have a beard. Like, I think he was probably a juvenile, really. I think that was his sister and little one. <laughs> and the little one looked just like him. The little one had a little black face, but it had whites in its eyes. Or had whites around the blacks of its eyes. I definitely saw that, but it looked just like him. It had black hands, it had black fur, and it was solid black. And she was holding its hand, her left hand holding its right hand. And, and I'm pretty sure I heard her go <gasps> like that when I jumped over that fence because at that time of the year, the fence was real grown up, you know, like the fence was covered with vines and grass and all sorts of crap. And of course, no one mows back there or nothing of course you know so when i jumped over it when i come, was coming at her she couldn't see me not where she was at if we wanted going out there i'll show you if hopefully it's all basically the way it was i'll show you where she was standing she's standing right beside a tree too and she made that gas i turned and looked at her and she pushed the little one back behind her and then immediately i heard the male yell and I turned back and looked at him, and he was moving along the outside of the trees. And when I turned back to look where, where they were at, they were gone. Her and the little one were gone. But I didn't stay. I instantly stood up and started running again because I thought, you know, I got him on my right and I got him on my left. Yeah. But, yeah, she was solid brown, matty, screwed up hair. Like she looked like she'd been laying in bed or something, you know, like she wasn't groomed like the way the little one or the big one was yeah maybe they were hurting for food i think so I, you know i think they're just kind of opportunistic too you know you leave a 55 gallon barrel of dog food outside on the porch where they're around your barrel of dog food is going to start disappearing you know and so i think it was just an opportunity I maybe it had seen me through the years and growing up watching me. I don't know because it sure could have grabbed me and pulled my head off. You know, it sure could have definitely came straight to me. Yeah. But it didn't. And you when know, it was it following you, sorry, um, when it right. was following you, could you see it the whole time? Well, so, you know, I'm freaking out. My mind's just freaking out the whole time. I'm just a kid, man. You know what I mean? I'm literally turning 13 that day, you know, and I just, I, I can't even explain the freak out. Like, you know, I sweat and I piss my pants. Whew. You know, so it was, you know, I just think it just wanted my fish. I think it had, I don't think it had plans to kill me. Although I think that, if it had known that I was that close to that female and that little one, I think he'd have come right to the woods right after me. 
just come right at me, you know, because I don't know. I just had that feeling that, you know, that I screwed up by seeing them. It's the feeling I had, you know, or that I was in better, more danger and better danger, more danger because I just saw them and startled them, you know. Yeah. So it was around eight or nine feet tall. How wide do you think the chest was? Four foot. Like, yeah, it was wide, bro. Mm-hmm. Huge upper body. It was shaped in a V, though. Like, not that its legs were too small for its body, but like two different times when it was standing on the outside of the edge of the, the trees there throwing shit at me, like it was faced right at me, and it was just a V body. It was just massive. And the the, the stick that he, he broke the stick that he threw at me at the end because he reached up and snapped the limb off, and I was turning to look at him because you know, I'm watching both ways, you know. And on the right, the woods are starting to get a little thinner as I get to the head of the creek area. So I could see further in the right and I could see that they weren't out there. So I was constantly looking right, looking left, looking right, looking left, duck down, trying to look underneath the cedars and see if I could see where the son of a bitch is at. And of course he'd be looking right at me. We just meet eyes. He'd be looking right at me, but he, he had a hold of a branch and I, it was an older branch. I'm sure. Cause it didn't have like eight foot of, limb on it and he broke it off and when he did it sounded like a 22 250 went off 50 yards from me you know just bang real loud and uh that's the stick i'm sure he used to throw at me the last time and hit me in the arm yeah i had a bruise it hit me it hit me all the way to the bone and it hit me flat it hit me flush like i don't know how exactly he threw it but he threw it and it hit me flush. Like the end of the stick didn't hit me. The exact flat, long part of the stick hit me at the perfect time right in my shoulder or right in my arm. And it clapped the bone hard enough and made everything drop out of my hand, you know? Yeah. And when it disappeared, did it just completely vanish or did it look like someone threw, um, like dirt in the air and it got taken by the wind. Can you describe that a little more? So I turn around and that, uh, when I've got him, when I got him about halfway up the hill, I turn around and look at first I didn't see it. And then I saw it looking right at me standing in a cedar and the cedar was probably eight, nine foot tall, nine or 10 foot tall. And he was standing in it like he butted up against it with his body or something, but the, the tree wasn't displaced, and the tree didn't have any breaks on it either that I could see when I got my my uh, stringer. I didn't see any breaks in the TV or in the TV. I didn't see any breaks in the in the tree. Yeah, so I don't know, but he's just looking right at me. He's looking up over his left shoulder, and I swear to God, he kind of had a smirk in his face. I didn't want to tell you that, but I swear to God, he did, dude. He had a smirk in his face. Like, ha-ha. Not like, I'll get you, but more like, ha-ha, or wasn't that fun, or I had a blast chasing you and terrorizing you. You know, you could tell it had like joy on its face. And then a little red orb just appeared out of nowhere. It didn't fly up. It didn't come sailing from above. It just poof into existence. And it came into existence right above us, two or three inches above his head. His head didn't move at this point. And it poof came into existence. And then instantly, right behind that, a white one came into existence. Just a little bit bigger, a little bit above, and a little bit behind this one. But they're both right above his head. And he just literally just disappeared. Like it wasn't even like, like it wasn't like, you know, like I dream a genie where she like kind of fades out. 
or something or like ghost movies you see him fade out he just you know up and disappeared like a fart in the wind orbs and all just him and the orbs gone yeah that is strange and i've experienced the orbs too when i was having the activity so i always what wonder color? they were both orange there's two of them and they're about four feet off the ground and they were moving through the woods and it was about an hour after i heard three whistles triangulate around me so i was going back up there to see if i'd experience anything more and that's when i saw the orbs but something told me like i had a gut feeling don't go near them. and the skeptic like I was thinking, um, it was either cell phones or someone with lanterns walking through the woods, but you didn't hear trying to reason it away. Yeah. yeah trying yeah. to reason it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what time of day was this? And, um, what month, if you can remember, it was September 19th, 1982, my birthday. Okay. I was 13 that day. Yeah. You More mentioned 69 okay. and, um, it was, it started about, all right, so I'll tell you another thing that I don't like to tell people, but it's true. I guess I should tell you. So I'm damn sure that I left the lake there or the pond at about 1.30 to 2 o'clock. Because I know how long I'd been down there. Back in those days, everybody wore a watch. Unlike nowadays, everybody looks at their phone for the time. You actually wore a watch in those days. And I had one of my grandfather's watches on, old Timex, as I'm sure you can remember them. You know, you never had to, they literally self-wound and all that stuff. And I'm just sure that I looked at the watch, and it was right around 1.30, about 30 minutes before this happened. But so that makes me take it off about let's just say between one thirty and two thirty, okay, to take off flying out of the pond back up to the trailer. So that distance is about a quarter mile, maybe, and it's brushy terrain. You know, it's definitely brushy terrain and then that hill makes up a third of it or a quarter of it but that doesn't make any sense to what time i got home and i after i grabbed 1100 changed into a pair of sweats walked into the living room it was like 10 after four yeah so you had some missing time there well I don't have any memories of doing anything else. I don't have any memories of gray aliens, which I've studied for years now, but I absolutely had missing time, that's for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned you felt sick after this encounter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was sick for a couple of days afterwards, and I don't know if it was just nerves and got some nightmares and shit, but I was physically ill for, you know, I don't really remember how long. I know I was ill for a few days because I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't get up the guts to even go outside, you know, for a week probably. But I went back down, I stepped back down in the woods with my grandfather while he was messing around by the, the, uh, cesspool and cutting brush and stuff and that's when I found my stringer come up and showed him too and he said yeah you just dropped it and I told him I found it stuffed in the tree and he just tripped or something it's like he did not want to you know he just didn't, did not want to play into it at all at all he didn't you know he just didn't have any comment for it you know yeah yeah, a lot of people get that way. Um, if you would, describe the feeling you had prior to the encounter. So, when I went over the other side, after the catfish died down, I put a couple on the string and I went across the other side of the pond. It's, uh, 
you know, obviously, yeah, I think I felt something over there. I heard stuff moving in the woods, without a doubt, because I was constantly turning around looking. You know, I didn't know if there was going to be a deer or something. At the time, at the time, you didn't have to worry about mountain lions and black bears in Missouri, really. Now, I say that, but two years later, we caught a mountain lion on that ridge. Or we didn't, the game department did. I'm sure you can probably find that in records. But so we didn't know that there was mountain lions and bears out there because there was just never any mountain lions and bears out there. We hunted everywhere all over the state on Fort Wood, north, south, east, west, ran rabbits, coyotes, foxes, you know, everything you could hunt. And I never saw a bear there. Never saw a mountain lion, never saw a cat track. Um, saw a bobcat a couple of times there, but you know, not a big cat, you know. And uh, you know what you asked me to tell you. Oh, uh, what was the feeling you had? Can you describe it? Like, did your heart start racing? Did you feel sick to your stomach? Well, I didn't feel well. So, when I was on the other side and I kept hearing whatever it was behind me I, my heart did kind of race a little bit you know because you didn't know what it was didn't know if it was lee hickey although i had permission i didn't like to get caught by lee hickey because that's another day he knows i'm down there and i fish there every day so i took fish on there all the time and i was just worried about him telling me that i couldn't come back you know so i would always try to avoid him or his family if i could about me and my uncle were down there fishing i'd always stay because he personally knew lee hickey you know, so I never ran when he was down there, but when I was on the other side of the lake, I'm hearing stuff behind me. You know, now I don't remember what it was. You know, I don't remember whether it was sticks breaking or something, because that would have made no sense to me. You know, I, I didn't have any reference to understand stick breaks or knocks. Now, that being said, I've had pebbles thrown at me a few times in the woods that I realized now and I've had knocks and I've had whistles or grunts. But one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me there, and it's just a little bit of nothing, but it screwed with me is I was going down over the back side of the, of the hill, headed down to the pond. And I think I had a 22 in my hand. Like I say, these are all things I had to dig up from my past before that to see if they made sense to this at all. But I'm I'm just past basically where the stringer was stuck in the in the stob. And it was like it was as if I had walked up on a deer that was laying down and it was like right on the other side of some shrubs or something, you know, and I didn't see it and it jumped up and shagged ass. Well, the problem is, is that there was no, there was no place to be a blind there in front of me. There was no place for it to hide and something right in front of me. And I mean, right in front of me somewhere, just bursting like it took off running like hell with the leaves, you know, just like, you know, and it startled me so much. And I fell backwards on my hands with the gun in my hand, kind of like, you know, you do like a reverse crab, like you do a crab walk. So I fell backwards from the sound and, and I'm instantly watching, don't see leaves peeling up, don't see branches, parting, don't, nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And I sat there looking under the brush, looking around for two or three minutes trying to figure out what the hell I had just walked up on. Never did see a thing. When I was 18, I went to the military, called back that same year, and I'm talking to my grandfather. My grandfather says, we got something screaming outside out here behind the house. I said, what? And he said, yep, we got something behind the house just screaming and carrying on. And he said, here, talk to your uncle. And my uncle gets on the phone, and I said, well, what's, what's going on behind the house? He said, hell, I don't know what it is. He said, but it just, just screams and hollers and carries on behind the house. And he said, it's done it all night for the last week, for the last like four or five days. And all I could think was is that was probably one of them back there, you know. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It sounds like it. So you started connecting the dots after you had your encounter. You started thinking back about different incidents that you've had and heard. And later on you've had things happen too, right? I've had nothing else happen to me in my life. Okay. I've stayed out of the woods. Uh, I don't hallucinate on a daily basis to speak to ghosts. What about you UFOs? Know? Have you ever had any UFOs visit you? I have never had a UFO encounter. I've never seen one up close. I've seen them. I've seen a couple of them in the sky. I had one respond to me one time with a laser light. Um, but I've never had a UFO like on my property or around the house or graze in the house of duck and me or anything like that. But that being said, there's a couple of strange stories in my family's history. Like my grandfather always built all the houses for my mom and my sister or my his three kids. My mom, my uncle, my aunt. But he always built their houses, you know, as they moved and grew as kids. And my mother and my aunt have an experience where they're living in one of the log cabins out closer to Waynesville. And a green orb came in through the wall and went all the way across the wall real slow, like with my aunt and my mom watching it and then went out the wall. At the same time, my grandmother woke up once and there were lights out the back of the house. And the only thing out the back of the house was a draw up to the top of the ridge line, just woods, no, no, you know, roads, nothing, you know, nothing. And the bright, the lights were so bright that she got up and I, I sat and watched her and my uncle talk about, I prompted them to talk about this at a, at a Thanksgiving about 20 years ago. And my grandmother said she came out of the door. The only, well, the only, room in the cabin was was her and my grandfather Jesse's bedroom and she come out the bedroom and my uncle Randy had a cot that I guess was right there basically against their wall or whatever and he was standing up looking out the kitchen window and he said what are those lights mom and she said I don't know and then I asked him did they remember what happened past that and they didn't the only thing my uncle could add to that is that at the time he was blaming the girls for waking him up every night. He said the girls would come in and wake him up every night and that they'd shake him by the toe and that I guess the girls eventually convinced them that they weren't doing it. And so the story changed from the girls waking him up every night, shaking him by the toe to a little old man shaking him by the toe and waking him up. Yeah, that is strange. Have you ever placed yeah. a connection with your Bigfoot encounter and the orbs you've seen alongside your family seeing UFOs and these strange lights? I've tried. I've tried and I can't. Mm-hmm. Although I have suspicion on both sides. In order for something to be considered as evidence to me, I need redundancy. So if you tell me one wild, fantastic story and it has X, Y, and Z in it, I'll politely shake my head and take your story, right? But until I get a second or a third person who confirmed the strangeness of your story, I can't, I can't confirm them as being real or the truth. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, you know? when this thing disappeared and you saw the orbs, um, do you think it had the ability to manipulate energy and matter? No. Nope. Do you think it's something paranormal, like something else behind all of this? Or do you think it's actual primate hominid creatures out in the woods? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure you're, you're not going to like this answer because you just asked me a bingo question. So I've done nothing but ufology and Bigfoot work since I was 13. So I've been on this path for a long time. I'm 53 now. I've been doing this for four decades. One of the guys that I grew up with named Jason Firth, who wound up killing himself, was an abductee friend of mine. 
and he would tell me all sorts of shit about being abducted, right? Never had any Bigfoot stories or anything like that, except one. And he would show me triangular marks on his body or holes in his body, like holes in his skin, like as if you took a pin, punched a hole in someone, and it'd always be kind of light green and healing. So you'd have them regular. But he helped set me on a on a trail to understand ufology at the time. So now I'm going to speed up to your question and give you the answer you're looking for. Bigfoot are just another primate hominid on the planet. They are not interdimensional. There is no need for an interdimensional being to have sweat glands, hair follicles, eyes that see at night on a specific planet or see specific rays of, of the sun on a specific planet. I would say that sweating and stink, hair, hair and sweat glands are pretty unique to, to a earthbound creature but bigfoot i began to understand something about 10 years ago and for someone who's actually followed the trail of ufology real ufology abductee ufology the only place where you find the truth the place where all mythos has come from, from the truth, like the world would have no idea that aliens uh, anally probe you if it wasn't for Whitley Streber, because that's where it came from. That's why people know what an anal probe is. How do they know that they're gray beings? Well, they know that from Dr. Simon's book with Betty and Barney Hill. They know that from the many books that Raymond Fowler made with Betty Luca, they know about it from Whitley Strieber and his many books and Bud Hopkins and Carla Turner and Dave Jacobs. So all of the information that's real in the UFO world came from abductee science. And here's what I've come to understand about abductee science. The genetic program goes on all across the world. All across the world. There's nothing that stops it. There's nothing that intervenes with it. All right, that was an awesome encounter. And as crazy as it sounds, I believe a story because of all the strange paranormal things I have encountered in my life. You guys know as well, if you follow the channel that I have encountered the orbs on several occasions, whether it's in the woods or up in the sky. So for the people that don't believe my UFO stories, is that Starlink satellites moving through the woods as well? Haha, -ha, you guys always have an explanation for everything. Just kidding, but I like to pick on the skeptics as well from time to time. On a serious note, I do feel the male Sasquatch he encountered would have torn him apart if it knew Chad was close to the female and the little one. I feel the whole time this jet black Sasquatch was trying to herd you out of the area so you didn't know its family was around and it also found the opportunity to take your stringer full of fish. What did you guys think about the orb scenario and the Sasquatch just disappearing right before his eyes? I mean, as crazy as it sounds, why don't we find any Sasquatch bodies? You know, not even a skull. How many times have you guys heard reports where someone talks about finding Sasquatch tracks and they just disappear? And it's not like Chad is the only one out there. There are many people who have claimed to see a Sasquatch and it just disappeared. Anyways, I appreciate everyone for watching. And if you guys can, please subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up. Be sure to check out my big film that's coming out this Sunday, and I appreciate everyone for watching. Thank you, and take care. Bye.